So from here, we'll kick it over to our panelists and who's able to attend with us. I have a list, so I'm just going to say your name. And if you can just repeat your name, say what uh, grade you're in, even if you're graduating senior, your graduating senior, your ISD, your school. And then um, the question I'm posing is what show are you watching right now? Or what do you think the theme music of your life would be? So I'll start off with Kennedy Kearns. You can start your mic and your camera and introduce yourself. All right, hi, um, I'm Kennedy Kearns. I will be a senior next year. Um, I am in SCUC ISD. Um, the question. Oh, right. Okay, so I'm watching The New Girl right now. Um, binge watching it mostly. Uh, it fills my time. Um, and the music of my life, I think it would be sort of mellow, but also kind of crazy and just all over the place, kind of eclectic. Because that's how life is right now, especially as a teenager. Thank you for uh, thank you for sharing. Um, next, we'll go to Lena Ramos. My name is Lena Rivas. I am a ninth grader at O'Connor High School. The music of my life would probably be any Ariana Grande song, because there's highs, there's lows, and there's times where you feel successful, and there's times where you feel like you haven't made it yet. Um, I'm watching Brooklyn Nine-Nine currently. Next, uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, is Deja Nuna on the call? And sorry if I butcher your name. Feel free to butcher your mind back. It's fine. Um, I'm Deja Nine. I'm in ninth. Well, I'm going into the 10th grade now. And I just... I literally just finished like yesterday Outer Banks and I'm about to start watching Alexa and Katie, like the last season of that. And if there was like a song or a mode to set my life lately, that's mm, probably just kind of like he hectic, but like at the same time calm and just grateful, I guess, that mm, everything's going well for my family during this time. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Melanie Harrell, if you could introduce yourself and come off you mute. Okay, let's see it. Hi, my name is Mel Harrell. Um, I just graduated from SISD. I went to Young Women's Leadership Academy. And then in the fall, I'll be enrolling at the University of Rochester in New York. So that's fun. And then uh, a TV show I'm binge watching right now is Wizards of Waverly Place. Um, watching that again, I'm about to finish. I think I have two more episodes. And a theme song for my life would be Waiting for Life, which is from one of my favorite musicals, which is Once on This Island. Just because it's always like talking about like how you want to just like go out and explore life. And I feel like since I just graduated, I feel like perfect for right now. And yeah, thank you. Hello, Hi, Oh, go ahead. Hi. I'm Clarissa. I will be a junior at Highlands High School. And my district is um, SAISD. The show that I'm currently watching right now is um, Binging Full House, the original. And the music to my life would probably just be something that just like mellow, I guess. I'm not too crazy. I like to just like go with the flow. Very nice. We all need a breather. Um, thank you, Clarissa. Gracie Hernandez. Gracie, can you come off mute and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Gracie. I am graduating John Marshall High School in two days. So that's exciting. I'm planning on attending Texas A&M University in the fall. Um, and I'm currently binging two shows right now, Criminal Minds and Gossip Girl. Um, and a song to describe me would probably be anything by Harry Styles or One Direction because I'm obsessed. Uh, is Giselle Reyes on the call? And if you are, can you come off mute and introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Giselle Reyes. I am a senior in Trinidad Garza Early College High School district. And the show I binge watch a lot is American Horror Story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
I'm going to be honest. Uh, I think I saw her on uh, Juliana Cruz. If you could come off mute and uh, introduce yourself. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, hi, my name is Juliana Cruz. I am also a rising senior at Trinidad Garza Early College High School, which is in the Dallas Independent School District. I am currently binge watching Money Heist and the music to my life. Well, I've currently been, um, I've had Blackbird by the Beatles on replay recently. And the, me the melody is really calming to me, so which is something I could use in the midst of all the chaos we're experiencing. Well, thanks everyone for doing those um, nice kind of setting of introductions and what we're hoping to accomplish in the next hour or so is really, uh, I'm calling it a square table. And we're really looking forward to hearing from you and making sure that any work that we do, not only in our policy, but also our education practice and our equity work is really centered around student and student voice. Uh, you know, today we're going to be focusing on school reopenings, the needs and the activism that each of you are participating in, in your local school districts or your communities, and then how we can help and moving forward, kind of be good partners to you as uh, student leaders in your different districts. So just a couple norms as we get started. Um, you know, we have a lot of people uh, who are here today and that's really exciting. We put out the call and we definitely were uh, super uh, thrilled to see the response. So uh, just make sure that we do a, a fair amount of step up, step back, uh, let folks have a chance and a turn and we want to make sure we hear from as many people as possible. As we go through the different parks, we're gonna to try to spend about 20 minutes on each section, especially the, the sections that Asma is going to be um, uh, navigating in the beginning. And then uh, last but not least, if you would like to speak, just make sure that there's an option where you can click to raise your hand and we'll make sure that everyone has a chance or come off mute and we'll be sure to to get, get you an opportunity to speak because we definitely want to hear from you and make this really a, a learning and a listening session for us as we look at these really heavy topics. Um, the last thing I'll mention before I, I send it over to Asma to begin our question series is do not feel pressured to respond. Uh, these are difficult questions and some of them are, are difficult topics and we really just want to feel and hear what what's really top of mind and most important to you. So share what you're able and know that we respect your individual experiences and appreciate your time. So with that being said, and some of the, the norms that we've placed on the table, um, I'm gonna send it over to Asma to begin our first part of questions for each of our students. Okay, so this is me again and um... Uh, yeah, I will be introducing the uh, first part of this session. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to share my feelings, if you would allow me to do so. So I am really uh, um, saddened and disheartened but by, by what I see here and the police violence. And it just reminds me um, of Egypt and um, during the revolution and uh, the police um, brutality I think is, is is something that is global and a lot of what is happening now just brings back all these uh, sad memories uh, in my mind. I identify as uh, like a Muslim, as an African, as an Egyptian and an Arab. I, I, I can understand even like like a little bit of what's happening and what most people the black community are going through now first the question is uh how are you feeling um how's how's everybody doing i know it's an unprecedented time um but yeah just in general how how do you feel okay kennedy would you well, i feel kind of desensitized to all the situations that are going on right now because it's been going on for so long, specifically the civil unrest that's um, been happening and all the turmoil that's been going on in the country. Um, with COVID and all that, I'm ready for it to be over because I'm, like emotionally, I'm kind of just worn out of being by myself and I need a lot of social interaction just to um, get back to a baseline kind of um, attitude, um, 
but I mean other than that I feel I just feel okay like I'm just kind of riding through the waves of what's going on um there's nothing bad really going on in my head but I mean that can change based on my mental state which kind of changes with the wind um but yeah um I'm kind of just feeling how everything's going and just listening to a situation and then reacting to it instead of letting my emotions run everything, if that makes sense. Oh, thank you, Kennedy, for sharing your feelings. Yeah, I'm feeling like a lot of the same feelings that like Kennedy's feeling, a lot of people are feeling right now, but at the same time, I'm also feeling optimistic um, on the civil side of everything. Like, of course, with COVID, like I'm still doing everything I can to like stay home, stay safe, do what I can to prevent the spread. But I'm also feeling optimistic with the change that is coming out of these movements and see, already seeing like lawmakers uh, feel the pressure of these protests and knowing that it's not going to go away. This isn't something that they can just wait out and that they're making change for the betterment of everyone. And I'm really happy about that. But other than that, for a long time, I was very angry. Um, I wanted to go and just scream like forever, but it's definitely been going forward and moving for the better. Well, thank you, Mel, for your sharing your feelings and thoughts. And I really appreciate your uh, positive uh, attitude towards uh, the situation. Yeah, please, Clarissa, would you share your feelings? Of course. During the time, I felt extremely overwhelmed between um, school having to end up online so quickly and feeling overwhelmed with, between the pandemic and all the civil unrest and the killing of these innocent lives. But I hope that with this panel and hoping that our voices will be heard that it will bring some type of light to the situation. Yeah, thank you, Clarissa, for sharing your uh, thoughts. So I think um, uh, a lot of what you have said, I think uh, echoes what Mel says too. Um, so looking at the bright side of the situation and uh, having voice, like not just internalizing the oppression, right? Uh, Lena? I feel very emotional. Um, the way school ended and going from eighth grade to high school, I lost like a good third of my friends. I'm not going to be able to see them or talk to them again. Um, we didn't really get to say goodbye. And then with quarantine, everybody's stepping on each other's shoes and we're just all in arguments with each other. And then um, I saw this video the other day of an African-American FedEx worker. And he said, even with all the protests and the riots, some people still don't get it. So the man was trying to deliver something and this Caucasian white older male almost ran him over with his car, rolled down his window, spit on him and called him a racial slur and just drove away. In the video, he was just crying saying that it's sad that people still think that way. Deja wanted to contribute as well. My opinion or how I look at this whole thing really is just how there's a lot of bad going on with just the civil unrest, but there's also a lot of good coming out of it, like with the changing and all. So I try to focus on being grateful that at least, even if it did have to sadly come to violence or taking extreme measures to get the lawmakers' attention that we are making change and I'm a part of a generation helping to make change at this moment. So although I know a lot of people don't agree with the protesting and the, some of the methods, I'm just happy that I can be a part of it and knowing that it's helping. And I think one of the things that really tugged at my heartstrings, because I've kind of been living in this bubble of, oh, everything's fine. But now that I'm old enough to really see what's wrong with the world, what the story that really tugged at my heartstrings was Ahmad Aubrey, just because he was, you know, just taking a jog when he was killed, not even by police officers, but just regular people. 
And I think ever since hearing that story, it's just been trying to do as much as I can to just help with the movement and bring change. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again for you know, for sharing your thoughts about that. Anybody else before we move to the second question? So I think most most of you going on or immigration or what, what do you think about um, immigration as well? Uh, Kennedy? Um, so I can, I wrote down some, um, some of my thoughts on COVID, uh, civil unrest and immigration. And um, so for immigration, I said, people trying to escape the dangers of their country by coming to America shouldn't have to fear being put into the same situation again because there's some confusion about the legality of it all. Um, people still believe in the American dream, but why do we want to make it the American nightmare for the people that need a dream the most? Immigrants founded this country, why are they being shunned now that they want to partake in the same commodities that we so covet? And I kind of, I meant that immigrants they came, they're coming here for a safe place to be and they shouldn't have to fear that they're going to be attacked or sent back into wherever they came from. If they came here for a better life, why do we, why are we trying to make them hide? Um, a lot of people focus mostly on the brown immigrants that come to this country and no one ever, no, people rarely talk about the white immigrants that come to this country from Ireland or England or anything like that. And it's just, the racism is so, the racism and xenophobia is so apparent whenever people talk about the immigration issue because when they, when you say immigration, the first that most people think of is Mexican immigrants. And which is just sad honestly because especially because of what's happening at the border right now and how ice is just destroying families and it's devastating honestly because the history of this country it was founded by immigrants and built on the backs of black and brown people so it's disheartening to see how they're being treated especially now Thank you. You are. Um, so I have a joint response on civil unrest and immigration. Um, personally, I I believe both of these things are the most important things right now uh, to me um, because the movements and the causes, they're like long overdue and they're necessary. Um, the people who are out there protesting, they're basically risking their lives and their health in the midst of a pandemic. And I respect them in that part because they are fighting for the justice that minorities, specifically black communities, are should already have in hand. And I do feel like the media coverage isn't necessarily where it's supposed to be because they are trying to portray um, all these protests so negatively, when in reality, the majority of them are peaceful and very considerate of the big picture, which is just um, fighting for the justice that black lives should have. Um, and also we can't necessarily silence people who have been silenced for centuries. And I don't think that authorities being hostile to maintain order is necessary when people are only exercising their constitutional rights. And in terms of immigration, um, most of the topics we're discussing right now, they're not really new. As a minority, I can tell you that I witnessed the evolution of these things. And one of them, of course, is uh, immigration um, in 2018. I attended a protest outside of a detention center that had children detained in Arizona. Um, and it was bringing awareness to this exact topic, which is kind of sad to see that it's still going on. Um, it's gutting to know that people are still being detained and that children are still being separated from their families under unhealthy circumstances, especially in the midst of a pandemic. And whether we believe it or not, it, it's morally wrong. And my heart goes out to the detained who are suffering under authority, not just immigrants, but also the minorities who's who have, their lives have been ha made harder because of um, the faulty system we're under right now. Um, so next we'll have Clarissa. 
I completely agree with what both girls said, and I agree too with um, Kennedy, especially about this being almost an American nightmare. My grandfather, my great grandfather, excuse me, came to the U.S. back back in the 1960s, and he was told, you know, to walk on the other side of the street, and just because he didn't know the language. Um, he is an immigrant from Mexico, and I wrote down some of my thoughts as well. I wrote the injustice that these minors endured to their parents' choices is heartbreaking. We as a country need to find a better solution and be the voice for these children. Even though the way these families came to the U.S. is not ideal, they long for a better life for themselves and a stable future for their families. Um, these families do come over here hoping that, you know, they're going to have a great education, they're going to have a stable future for their children and their great-grandchildren. And I just think that the way our country's leaders are handling the problem is not the correct way. And I do agree that us as a country and me being a, a minority and having immigrant grandparents and great grandparents and family members that we need to fix this. Thank you. Mel also had our hand up. Yeah, I feel like a lot of what's happening in this country and people are saying, well, it's their civil like like responsibility and it's their right to do these things. But a lot of the laws that they're in violation of aka protesting and things like that it was built with an asterisk um for example when um people were protesting um fully armed just to have the stay-at-home restrictions lifted they they weren't met with any violence but when people are protesting to not be killed for no reason in the streets by people who are given this authority they are met with that same authority that they're wanting to change. And then the government is trying to twist it in ways, along with the media, that it's their fault for going and starting these riots. When in reality, I've gone to a few protests myself. Um, the one in San Antonio that happened a few weeks ago, it ended up becoming violent because police started to become violent with the protesters. When in the beginning it was just us, when it was just us marching th through the streets, chanting with our signs, we we're all being safe, wearing masks. But in reality, people are trying to twist it to discredit us, discredit our movement. And this is something I've been fighting for for years. When it comes to um, Black Lives Matter, when it comes to women's rights, immigration rights, um, no one really takes protests the right way unless it's led by people who they can agree with. Um, based off of the color of their skin, when it comes to like woman-led protests, especially protests led by Black women, there's always that assumption it's going to be violent, and then that's why police show up and then throw tear gas, use rubber rubber bullets incorrectly because rubber bullets aren't made to be shot directly at people when they shouldn't even be using them in general. And I do feel like. Um, as everyone has been echoing, the civil unrest right now and the immigration, it's long overdue. And then this change is coming from youth right now, which is very positive thinking about the future, especially with this upcoming election to see how things will turn out. Thank you, Mel. Um, and it looks like also that Deja has her hand up. And then after Deja, we'll go ahead and move on to the next question and Asma will ask it. I was just agreeing on, I don't, I don't remember exactly who had said it, but um, with the immigration issues that we have going on right now, there there's a lot of different opinions on it, obviously, but I think it would just be so much easier if our government just updated the system because we've been working with the same system for, I don't know how long, just years, and it's obviously not working, so we need to make stand up and you know, make, make them know what they're doing. Need, it just needs to be changed at this point. Like if it's not, I'm trying to figure out the words how to say it, but if something's not been working, same thing. Um, This guy that I watched the video, he made a very good point. He said that we've been using the constitution um, for years and that was never meant for, you know, people of color it was always, going towards white people or Caucasian people. So I think it's just time for our country to just kind of take a look 
and just redo everything that we've been doing at this point, you know, like just take a chance to reconstruct this country. So schools will reopen. What would you like your local school or district to, to do change or eliminate to make your you feel more welcomed and safe and comfortable as you return for the upcoming school year? Okay, Mel. I feel like right now is as we see COVID at the moment, now is not a good time at all to reopen schools. How a lot of schools are shaping the reopen, their reopening plans, it's going to be too hard on the students and it's also going to be too hard on the parents. And then just to enforce the proper implementations from CDC and health experts, most importantly, it would just be too much. It would for the students, especially with how school districts are considering half days, it won't work out, especially with parents having to work again and going back to work. It would not be in the best interest of schools to reopen so soon. I do believe that for some students, it is important to go back to campus, but there's a time when going back would be safe for the students and making sure that everything will be streamlined. I'm working with a group of right now with um, teachers, parents, students, health experts to try to see if reopening schools could even make sense in the fall. And that a lot of what we're seeing is it honestly wouldn't. And although online learning is very hard for anyone, I had to finish my senior year online and just taking AP tests was a huge struggle. But also the health of students is is extremely important, especially when so many students have like immune out of immune problems and also taking care of like living with grandparents and stuff like that it just wouldn't be in the best interest also i feel like w along with the civil unrest that students should be at the front of spearheading changes to school to school policing policies and that's something that also needs to happen within the next school year even though it's also as we've been saying a um, very long overdue Okay, Kennedy, could you please uh, go on? My thoughts about COVID are it scares me, but not enough for it to matter in my head, which I'll explain like this. Logic flies out the window when my ever evolving emotional state shifts and craves human interactions. So logically, I know that we shouldn't go back to school and that it's a horrible idea to force so many in my school at least 2000 people in a small space for eight hours a day that's a horrible idea especially considering the climate but emotionally i cannot handle the isolation anymore and the only way for us to be able to balance out how logically we shouldn't go back to school, but emotionally, we need the social interaction is to. Well, here's how I think it it should work. Um, making us go to school in shifts, so it's online for most of the time, but the classes that you really need to have in in person are in person and there's more teachers, so everyone's separate, like algebra would be in person, you'd have one class of algebra on like Monday and then everything else is online. I don't know how easy that would be to implement because I'm not an administrator and I have no experience in trying to do something like this, but then again, who does? And I don't really see anyone else giving very good ideas. My mom mentioned that they were thinking about doing a block schedule, which wouldn't help either because 90 minutes a day in a classroom is worse than 50 minutes a day. So I think we're all just, we're trying to find a solution, but I think we're all kind of stuck inside of a box and we need to get out of that box in order to figure out what would be best for all of us. Um, Asma, if I could jump in real quick. I know that um, the Dallas ISD students along with their teacher and um, I believe it was a professor put together a really, I haven't read it because I'm waiting to see how we can get it, but uh, a publication on COVID and race. I was wondering if like, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, Gisela or Juliana or someone would like to speak, maybe to some of the findings or what that was like, or even just 
you know, in general, like COVID and race and those intersections that you seem to have been exploring in your class and with your teachers? Yeah, we we um, made up and well, not made up. We wrote an anthology. It's basically a composition of um, stories and experiences of that have to do with COVID and race. Most of them are like kind of diary entries, um, just kind of summarizing how COVID has been like, how quarantine has been like, and also um, how it has affected us as minorities in this country. And um, the book, it's called Faceless, The Untold Side Effects of Culture, Race, and COVID-19. That's the title of the book. And um, well, yeah, most of it, it was just experiences of race and writing it. It was kind of difficult because we had to do everything online most of it was just um, meeting up with uh, with the administrators through Zoom, and a lot of decisions had to be made. I was actually in the editorial board, and um, I did a lot of the behind the scenes things where we had to actually like pick the cover, pick the title, and all of these things, and just putting it out um, was pretty difficult since everything was online. But yeah, we got it out. Is, um, would you like to add anything? Each of us wrote two pieces that were about like racism and COVID-19 and like our experiences or somebody who in our family experienced something in those sorts. Um, I believe that when it comes to entering during the pandemic in school, that there should be precautions that are made, like we should be wearing masks or somebody should be checking like in the entry of the school, if somebody has any symptoms, like a high fever, to make sure that they can't come in school, in the school, to make sure that we are safe. Also, when it comes to immigration, there are some clubs in our school, like LULAC or Joe, that help students that are dealing with any issues with the immigration system. Thank you for highlighting some of those organizations that are um, providing those direct services. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to add in or discuss? Maybe someone who hasn't spoken, like Gracie or Lena? Um, so I think that going back to in-person teaching is a good idea, but at the same time, why are you going to risk putting students' lives um, in like danger of catching COVID, but especially teachers, because teachers have families to go home to, and so do students. Like, um, I don't think that it should be like students should have to worry about, oh my God, like I'm going back to school. Like, am I going to catch this from one of my classmates or is it going to be a thing? Um, in my school, like, is it going to happen? And if we go back, are we going to have to go back to online learning? Because I know that once um, they announced that school was going online, I'm pretty sure that everyone was like, well, we were just in class yesterday, so why are we, like, no one understood, but I know personally that a bunch of people at my school aren't following the social distancing laws, um, like, especially the seniors, they think that just because they're seniors, they can go out and have fun and do all these things just like senior year, but it's not safe to do that. And I think that if schools were, were to open up, I feel like people would think that they have the freedom to do those things, um, which they're not allowed. But also, I don't know personally, I just feel like there would be a lot more bullying with different like races. Um, because I've seen it on social media where uh, Chinese people or like any kind of people, they're just getting bullied because it's like, oh, well, you're this race, so you have COVID and you gave us all COVID. And I just don't want people to be bullied because being bullied like isn't a thing that should be allowed. And I feel like going back um, to school, there would be more bullying with like all the students that are going through something right now that's a problem in the world. I feel like it would be a really bad idea to go back into school because I know a lot of kids would um, 
break social distancing or just take off their mask or their gloves or whatever rules we have to follow because they a lot of kids didn't really think it was a big deal and I know they still think it isn't and um I know because of what happened with the George Floyd my school we are very very political so we are always willing to get into a debate so I know a lot of kids who are just going to get into this fights over what happened to George Floyd and was the cop right, was George Floyd right, or any type of act. Deja, did you have your hand raised? Um, yes, I personally just kind of disagree a little bit just about us going back to school. I think it we it's about time that we do go back to school just because um, if we keep, like the COVID is never gonna go away. There's no, like it's, a, it's here now, same thing with the flu. Like there's no cure for the flu. It's not gonna ever go away. It's still there. And I feel like if we keep living like this, like, we still go to school just fine with the flu, and sometimes kids get sick with the flu, and they might pass it on, but they, you know, go home, get better. I feel like it's the same with COVID. Like, if we keep letting it just kind of rule our lives, it's, it might stay permanent, like be a permanent change, because it's I'm trying to think. I feel like if we let it rule our lives then everything will just stay permanent. We're going to be like, oh, this is how we live now. But with other um, sicknesses that go around and stuff, like I get that COVID is pretty um, serious and I'm not trying to like make it sound less um, like serious or whatever. However, um, the flu I know is also very serious and they didn't shut down school. Like I understand why they shut down school. I think it was a great decision. However, I don't think it should stop us from going back to school at this point because we can't, it's just gonna keep putting everyone behind. And at this point, um, like I, I didn't mind online school. I was just kind of like, okay, whatever, there's nothing I can really do about it. But also I know a lot of people who are struggling with online school. And I feel like a lot, like including myself, I prefer to be learning in a classroom. And even if we wait longer, how long are we gonna wait? There's no timetable that's gonna predict like how can you when exactly we're gonna get to go back to school without with it being totally safe? Like I just don't think that's gonna be possible because um, you know, like I said, it's never gonna go away just because like people start getting better. It's always gonna be here now. So I think it's better if we kind of start trying to get back to school. Obviously, we're taking precautions like maybe wearing masks. And I understand what um, I, th I don't remember exactly who said it. Sorry, but about kids wanting to take off masks and all that. But it's honestly, it's already like that now. We've already had a, a nice um, before protesting. We already were having a nice decline, even when they had reopened up the state. And honestly, the only spike. Was so it was when the protesting started. So we were we were doing well as it was with Texas reopening. So I feel like we do need to start attempting to get back into some form of a regular life without letting COVID totally rule what's going on. I see Kennedy and Mel. Kennedy, do you want to go next? Um. So I just want it. This will be quick, but I just wanted to say that uh, the spike. It, it happened as the protests were happening. And since COVID has a two week incubation, right? I think that's um, incubation, um, whatever that word is. Um, it Because we opened, there was a spike, not because protests happened, there was a spike. And a lot of the protesters are taking the necessary precautions that are needed to prevent COVID. So I don't, like, I do think that there will be a spike because of the protests, but not as big as a spike as there was and is because of the reopening. That's all I have to say. Mel? Yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing Kennedy did and that the spike that we're seeing now is actually for Memorial Day weekend um, when states were allowing people to go, like, back to rivers and stuff like that. But 
exact same thing that Kennedy said that um, we will see a spike in the next two, like I would say week or two now, um, up to three weeks. But as of right now, we haven't seen a direct correlation between the Black Lives Matter protest and the current spike that we're seeing now. Clarissa, do you have your hand raised? Yes, ma'am. Um, with the online sessions, I would definitely like in school sessions to be as minimal as possible with that being that I have family members with underlying conditions. Um, and just to protect myself and others that I will come in, that I would probably most likely come in contact with. Um, COVID-19 has definitely made it difficult for me to decide if I would feel safe going back to school. But I think that if we were to continue online sessions, I've seen firsthand with my younger siblings that, you know, I know it's the first time that we've ever had online school because it's as if we've never really had a pandemic is, that has impacted us so greatly that it would, I think that there needs to be a little more like structure, especially with the younger kids, because I'm older, I'm a little more responsible. I believe that I will get my work done because grades really do matter to me, but with somebody like my younger siblings who has dyslexia, and is falling behind now because their teachers, you know, they have they have their family, but I think that, you know, they have to devote a little bit of time to help other like their their students because if not, they're gonna fall behind even more. And the fallback that my brothers already have to already have they have to depend on so much from our teachers to get them get them the education that they can. That I believe that. I just believe that they need to put a little more structure. And I think like, for instance, my school, I can't speak for all students, of course, or all um, districts, but my school, you know, our administrators were supposed to check on it, check in on us and join the meetings. And half the time, the administrators and the teachers would have a conversation about what they were doing last weekend or how your family is doing. And I think that that's great, but or they ask, they'll ask um, younger kids like, well, how, how, how are you feeling? And, They'll take about 30 minutes of the session and the session's only 45 minutes just to go through processing of, you know, what color you're feeling today, green, blue or red. Like, and I, I agree that they just want to make sure that everybody's mental health is great. Everybody's physical health is good. But I just believe that they need to just kind of devote more time into the direct learning rather than just trying to like lollygag <laughs> Thank you, Clarissa. And I think everyone's answers to this and something that we've seen unilaterally is when you're faced with complex and hundred year uh, lifetime issues, there's not many, not many answers, but I think uh, it's been, this is the most valuable part is making sure we're uplifting y'all's voices who are dealing with this daily. So thank you for sharing this and, um, yeah, in fact, it's funny. Uh, I just took my temperature as we were going this and I have a fever. So I'm going to get a COVID test today. It's just like this weird reality that we all live in. Um, it's probably because I uh, went to one too many marches, but that's okay. We're going to get through it together. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think going back to Mel's point and some of the other points that uh, were made around not only what we're going through when it comes to how can we be protected healthcare wise, but how can we be protected uh, in, in interacting with police and the authorities and school districts in general in this age where people are looking for even a, a reconfiguration of schools? Like what are, what are things that you think would be helpful to, to promote your safety as students and to kind of promote, uh, you know, instead of being focused on like uh, criminalizing schools, like what would it look like, do you think, to have like a safe school for, for students coming back in the fall and virtually or in person? Mel, if you wanna start, I see your hand. Yeah, so I'm a part of another group called the um, SISD Student Coalition. And one of the things we've been advocating for, we kind of started advocating this at the beginning of the school year last year. And one of our things is ensuring like more crisis intervention, more counselors on campus. Um, one of the schools in our district, Sam Houston, 
I forgot what the name was, which is so bad because it was such an amazing program, um, is where students, um, every day they could go, it was kind of like a group session where they can go and like express themselves. And I forgot, I forget the exact number of fights um, that decreased, but I know it was somewhere around like 40 that dropped down to like a single digit number just by having that space for students. So instead of pushing funding of campus police, instead of pushing that towards having more social workers, counselors, and more crisis interventions on campus to prevent problems from happening in the first place. And then this is seen um, with the group that was at Sam Houston, and it could be implemented in almost any district if you just um, work around the budget and try to do your best and also working with nonprofits in the community, also bringing communities back on campuses. I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt, but Mel, were you talking about restorative practices? Yes, restorative restorative justice. justice. I love restorative yes. justice. I, yes. just I am so glad you said that. Yeah. So what? Thank you. Yes, it's um, one of the I'm best sorry. ways to prevent violence from even happening is just giving that safe space to students. And it could also be done online. Uh, with friends who are having trouble staying connected and keeping that communication with students, building that from an early age, take into the real world. And it would just overall make society better if this was implemented um, in K-12 learning. Gisela, do you have your hand raised? Or Giselle, am I saying your name wrong? I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's Giselle. Um, I was thinking that we could have larger classrooms so that there can be some distance between each desk to make sure that nobody gets the virus. So there can be like social distancing going on. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Kennedy? Um, I think that hiring more teachers and having more classrooms, um, even and even if that needs to be portables, um, and just spreading out students and having smaller class sizes because, um, while having bigger classrooms is like a brilliant idea so that we could have more space between the desks, it's probably not going to happen given that schools don't like renovation isn't exactly on their mind, um, especially in this pandemic, renovation of the buildings at least. Um, so hiring more teachers, having smaller class sizes, um, and like I was saying earlier, maybe just having us go in shifts instead of having everyone go every day at the same time all day, which it just seems so dangerous because COVID is a devastating disease. Even if you survive it, you could need a lung transplant or you could be crippled for the rest of your life. Even if you're 16 or 25, you're, you, it's absolutely devastating. The effects are just horrible. But um, aside from the dangers of COVID in the, in the classroom, like what, what, with what Mel was saying, um, with stopping the violence that's on campus and that can happen on campus and the discrimination and all that. I think a lot of it starts, um, well, of course it starts in the home, but we can't really fix that at the moment. Um, but we could at least start young and teach them what it means, not just sharing is caring, but okay, here's, we're gonna have an actual conversation about this person looks different than you, but it doesn't mean they're different. It doesn't mean that they mean that they're less than you. We're a conversation that promotes equality from a young age so that we're not we're not 18 and just got out of high school and are only now learning about Malcolm X on social media. That's ridiculous. We just need more education on what's going on around us and how and more about the social issues that can affect us because if you live your whole life thinking that everything is one way and then 
you graduate high school and you're in the real world and you figure out that it's a completely different way than how you were taught, you're not going to be able to survive. So I think that implement like teaching more history about our country and what it was actually founded on and how it grew and who was used and who was being who was using who was using whom and who was being used i'm getting riled up just thinking about it but i think it would be beautiful to see every see people having an intelligent conversation about how the effects of racism on the media or something like that even if they don't think they're the smartest kid in the class just being able to have some sort of knowledge on it which that was off topic but i think it's still relevant today definitely rele relevant especially as we know right uh, that there's over policing in schools especially in black and brown communities and we see that not only in this situation but it permeates throughout and unfortunately that often is that pipeline the school to prison pipeline that we talk about juliana yeah um i did want to go back to the reopening of schools a little um and mention how it's kind of hard to say if we should or not um simply because um the online curriculum isn't necessarily as interactive as uh, a classroom would be. And a lot of people's homes are not necessarily the great, the greatest learning environment. So those are things I think that the administrators should keep in mind. Also, since um, a lot of people probably don't have the resources that many schools might offer um, at home. And in terms of just like school and school touching on the topics of civil unrest and immigration i feel like these topics should be um openly talked about in school um considering that in my particular um environment there's a lot of minorities and um that there's a lot of minorities that are affected by civil unrest and immigration i am lucky enough to go to a school that offers the african-american and mexican-american studies but um i know that a lot of the schools statewide don't offer those uh, curriculums. So, um, which earlier this year they actually approved that the Texas Board of Education approved the curriculum, so other teacher, so other schools could offer them. But I still don't think that those classes should be offered as electives, but rather um, core curriculums, so that other people can be educated about uh, minority issues and um, just to open up the conversation of immigration and why civil unrest is important. It educates us on how to understand the voices of others, especially when it comes to those topics. Thank you, Juliana, for sharing, and thank you to your school and your principal and all of your, all of the students who worked on that. You definitely led the charge on making sure that African American studies was now a part of uh, state curriculum. And to your point, uh, IDRA fully agrees that MOS and African American studies should not just be an elective, but should be a part of everyone's education. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? If I'm sorry if I don't see your hand raised. Clarissa? Okay, go ahead. Um, off of what both Juliana and um, Kennedy said, I agree that we should be um talk more about african american and mexican mexican american studies because our land was built by like we are our land is immigrants it's just that you know everyone was brought over here and i believe that as a young woman and as a minority that going um, excuse me going back to the to the civil unrest with schools and all that as a young woman and a minority um I, you know everybody is entitled to their own opinion whether I think it is wrong or right. Um, and I just think that it can sometimes be unsafe when those um, conversations are talked about. But I also really do hope that one day soon we'll be able to we'll openly talk about these situations and there won't be a problem. Everyone will peacefully talk and have a conversation that gets somewhere rather than ending in violence or ending with someone being angry because you don't have the same outlooks as somebody else. So, yes, Gracie, 
I think after Gracie, we'll move on just as an FYI. If anyone else has anything else to say. Um, I think piggybacking off of what Clarissa and Juliana were saying about um, Mexican American studies and African American studies. I know that this year at my school was the very first year that we had MOS as an elective. And I think it's important to have a teacher who's teaching those classes be proud of what they're teaching and feel comfortable to have open conversations about things that are happening in the world in the class. Because if you don't have a teacher like that, then you're just kind of holding yourself back from wanting to learn more because someone else in the class can have the same question or want to talk about the same thing. But if your teacher isn't comfortable having those conversations with you, then what's the point? Because you're not learning, like you're there to learn. And if they don't want, if they don't feel comfortable talking about like what should be talked about, then what's the point of taking the class? Because I feel like having those classes can help others understand like what's happening in the world like today um does that make it does that make sense i hope that makes sense but yeah i just feel like having someone having a teacher and having also like a family as like a class like as a whole in the class and that makes you feel comfortable talking about certain things um can help not only you but also help your classmates and other people in the future with things that are happening in the world. One more question before I'm going to send it to Paula to discuss kind of what we know about reopenings and schools look like now, but do, do these small groups kind of settings and conversations like this, do you find them helpful in thinking through like your, um, the realities that we're faced now or students are faced now? So anyone wants to respond to that? Uh, Juliana, do you want to go first? See your hand raised. Um, I think this is a very good thing that we're doing right now because um, you y'all have provided for us a safe environment to share our opinions and thoughts and feelings about the current climate of our of our realities. Um, because not many people take into account what we're actually feeling. They just kind of make a decision for us and assume that it'll be all right because we're young and we're malleable and we'll adapt. I mean, and while we will adapt to most situations, we should still have a say in what the situations are. Um, and I just want to say thank you for allowing us, for allowing me, at least I can't speak for everyone, um, but thank you for allowing me to speak about um, these topics because, no, I mean, it's one thing to s go off on, on Instagram or Snapchat about how you feel about the civil unrest or immigration or something like that, but it's another thing to actually have a productive conversation with other people in the presence of people that can actually make a change. So thank you. Well, we're really appreciative of y'all's time and to your point, it, it is, it's beyond crucial that you are centered in all of our conversations um, as students and as people who are living this day to day. Um, Deja, do you have your hand raised? Yes, I was just gonna kind of piggyback off of Kennedy because I also agree that during school, we don't really get the chances to talk about the, the social unrest or just immigration, racial tensions because uh, one, I, one of my teachers actually said they could lose their job just for talking about things that they um, don't think that we need to know yet. However, it's great to have people um, be able to give their opinions and I be able to give my opinions on something and not be judged for it and not have to worry about just other people going back off of it like, oh, I can't agree or starting issues because, you know, it is virtual and I don't want it to sound like, oh, you're just hiding behind a screen or whatever, but it is good to finally have a safe kind of a safe place to talk about everything and not like I just said not be judged and everything going on and have like no filter really so I'm just glad thank you um for kind of providing that for us I were able to um Lena did you have your hand raised um yes I wanted to say that it it allows me allows me to share what I learned 
and learn from others. And most adults don't think that kids our age should know about these this stuff and that we shouldn't be able to talk about it because it's inappropriate when it's what's going around in the world right now. And I personally, I want to be in the know. I want to know what's going on. Because in reality, it's our generation that's going to have to fix it. And having conversations like this just makes it easier to accept what's going on and figure out solutions. No, you're absolutely right. Because these conversations can't stop here. And we know that. And I, I think it also speaks to your power as students. And I can't tell you as someone who's worked in legislative spaces and worked for elected officials, how fearful they are of you. And um, we're really hoping to be helpful in uplifting every one of y'all's voices. So thank you again. And I think uh, the last person we'll hear from is Mel. Do you have your hand raised or is that an old hand? I wanna make sure that we give you a chance if you wanna speak. Yeah, I think, um, well, I was trying to raise my hand, but I think I kept accidentally pressing it like to keep raising my hand. But I just wanted to say that these conversations have to start somewhere. And then a lot of organizations are thankfully starting to realize the power and overall like responsibility that they have to include youth voice in conversations like this because youth um, were, to, were the today and we're the, the future. And our opinion does matter because eventually we're gonna be in those positions to make the change. And it sh we shouldn't have to wait until we get a degree because we are still important and our opinions are still valid and should be taken into consideration at all levels of policy making from school districts to the national level. Well, thank you again. And you're absolutely right. Uh, just gonna say that over and over again, how powerful y'all are and how we're appreciative we are, you guys, uh, we are of y'all to share y'all's voice with us and your opinion. Um, I think at this point, I know we're a little short on time and uh, want to make sure that we're mindful of folks' time, but Paula, did you want to kind of speak to where we are and what we know, and then maybe we can discuss next steps before closing out the session? Yes, thank you, Anna. Um, I just wanted to, one, thank you all again. Um, I didn't get to introduce myself um, to you earlier. I am Dr. Paula Johnson. And I'm the director of the IDREX South. We're an equity assistance center um, that operates in 12 states in the US South. And so we're not just looking at Texas, which is where we live. Um, I have students still in um, K-12, well, two middle schoolers, um, but we also work across 12 states. So with state education agencies, uh, regional education service centers, and something like 2700 school districts are we are able to assist um working on issues of equity and so restorative practices is one thing that we do uh that's why i mentioned that to mel but we understand that um in these last few minutes i just wanted to share we know that for those of you still going back to school and congratulations to those grads um school, no one i mean there are some ideas about what school would look like um and when we talk about not being able to do renovations of course can be there's no one has the budget to renovate every single school in their district right but they are trying to take measures where they would do rotating schedules um so students would not be at school every day they're looking at how student desks would be able to be distant from each other so that no one's right on top of each other and of course we have to consider that these things look different at every grade band right so when you look at an, uh, a preschool, I have a niece who works in a preschool. It's very good. It's very different because you can't keep a two year old. You know, it's difficult to keep them in a mask all day long. They don't understand what's going on versus someone in high school. But you do still have people who don't really believe that they can get sick. So there are a lot of things at work here. But um, TEA is looking at how we need to adjust our school calendars, how we need to adjust um, guidances in the classroom. Um, to allow for safe returns. I don't think anyone is going to go back to school the way we have been. Um, so we, I want, we want you to know though that we are taking notes. We have some interns on the call and they're taking notes of all of your um, concerns, suggestions, recommendations, um, and your input. And your, your voices are extremely important to us. And we just thank you again. And as you mentioned, I want to say one more thing about the 
um, uh, Mexican American studies and African American studies. We are so proud of the effort of the students um, contributing to this work and we are committed to keep it going. Next week, we're going to have um, some panelists that are from the State Board of Education that helped in this initiative. Um, trustee um, Aisha Davis and Trustee Marissa Perez and then a few other members um, of our community here in San Antonio from um, Black Lives Matter and from the My Brother's Keeper initiative to talk about the adult recommendations. And then we hope that you will be able to join us again on the 30th because we wanna have the adults in the room and the students in the room to have the second part of this conversation. So just know that people are working um, for your safety and understanding your emotional well-being. As a math teacher, I totally get it that sometimes we need to be in the room, but we've got to work it out. Um, and so there's also a MAS Academy next week that's going to be including some students. I want to throw it in from uh, Aurelio Montemayor. But you have had such a mature conversation today about some very real world topics. And so we are not going to treat you like children. You are young adults, young women who are paving the way for, um, for your future and for our future as a society. So we thank you again. Um, Anna, I'll, I'll send it back to you to close. Yes, just as uh, Dr. Johnson mentioned, uh, we are going to have the advocacy panel next week, but um, our third installment and something that we're going to invite everyone who is on this call to participate in is a meeting of those two panels. So having not only our advocates and elected leaders, uh, but also the student voices that need to be centered in those conversations lead the conversation. So the last thing that um, besides the the information we've been taking down throughout this entire just uh, really eye opening conversation that we've had and y'all as advocacy and education leaders. Um, if there are policy recommendations and things that you think need to be uplifted when we're going to be speaking like truth to power, essentially, like have those um, in your thoughts and start kind of putting those together as we head into that, that final panel the next couple weeks. And ultimately, we also as a PACE team uh, or a policy team want to continue this conversation with y'all uh, as we know this is developing fast, almost too fast, uh, and it feels very reactory. And we know that these are those opportunities that the bad actors, unfortunately, will come to play. So we have to fight just as hard, if not harder. Um, with that being said, I, I can't thank you all enough for participating and your kind words. Uh, they, they make this job a lot easier <laughs> as we're going to face a lot of difficult uh, times and issues together. And uh, with that being said, I, we're going to end the session and please, if you're able to participate in the next couple weeks and, and continuously in these conversations as we're talking about education, but also higher education and policy decisions that should be made with you and not for you, uh, we want to help uplift your voice as young leaders in, in Texas and elsewhere. So. That, that being said, thank you guys. We'll, we'll let you go uh, a little, not, not pretty much on time. And I'll keep you all updated on my COVID tests and whether or not I come back positive. <laughs> but thanks again, guys. And we hope to talk to you soon and um, have a good rest of your day. Bye.